I was in math. And then we heard what it sounded like, girls screaming. The fire alarm rang. We went, one of my social studies teachers blocked traffic across Pierce to get us across to Leewood. And we were there for what seemed like an eternity. And then chaos kind of erupted. One of my best friends came out and said, Mandy, we have to go, they're shooting. And I said, who's shooting? And there was a lot of rumors that they were on the roof. By that time, news helicopters had come. And there was a rumor, you know, they're shooting at the helicopters. Like it just, it went crazy. So then that was the time when we saw some staff members. And like Zach, I was very concerned about my math test. And so she said, you need to go to a safe place. And we're like, what does that mean? She said, find a house, go to a house. And so we essentially kind of got permission to go. Well, somebody said, hey, go to so-and-so's house. His dad's a cop. So I just followed this group of kids. I bet there was 50 of us. Mm -hmm. We got on the, like, there were a couple people who had cell phones, but this lady's house, she, um, gave the phone to different people and in my head it didn't occur to me to call anybody like who do i call so then i was in young life at the time and my young life leader happened to be at that house and he said mandy you need to call your mom my mom was at king carl she was a teacher and she i couldn't get a hold of her because they were out, out lockdown apparently and now years later she, i was the first one to get a hold of her and so everybody that called my mom like family members knew i was safe I don't know for some reason I had this instinct that my dad would come and get me. So um, this kid's brother said, hey, does anybody need to ride to Leewood? And I said, I do. Like, I know my dad's going to be there. My dad worked at the King Supers down the street. We went to Leewood and it was, of course, chaos. And it was kind of surreal. My friends that I just left were in science and I knew them that they were in science. Their parents were there. Well, unfortunately, you know, they didn't get out hours later. My dad found me and I was wearing a dress that day because it was a track day and we always dressed up for sports and he wouldn't let go. And as a parent now, I just, it's hard to realize what my dad went through that day. And I didn't think anything of it until I became a parent and how, how my parents must have felt that day. And years later, years later, I went to both of my parents and said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry the way I acted because now I get it. Now I get it. And same, you know, it's surreal. You don't know where you are, what you're doing, and you go home and you just live through it and try to get through, the, through it as much as you can. And it, it didn't affect me as much as it has until I became a mom. Uh, so I was in the math department and I was in the process of, of taking a quiz and um, I just retrieved my calculator and I just sat down and I heard some raised voices out in the hall and I had assumed they were uh, some kids goofing around or maybe a, a scuffle or a fight had broken out and then the fire alarm gets pulled almost immediately and once again, made the assumption some kids were screwing around and maybe a fight had started and nobody knew how to respond to it, so somebody pulled the fire alarm so the teachers would be drawn to it. I didn't know. So yeah, we all stood up, kind of lackadaisically. Uh, I remember looking down at my desk and thinking what I wanted to take outside with me as I was, I mean, not taking the fire drill very seriously. Um, and then uh, a teacher from the math department throws the door open and braces the door open with his body and says, get out of here. And so we all realized, okay, this is serious. And I remember the thought that occurred to me was, oh, it's an actual fire. There's really a fire and it's very near apparently. So we're all getting up and, and moving towards the door and he is throwing us out the door, I mean, grabbing us by the scruff of the neck and pushing us out of the door. And same situation, we're, we're kind of, not really walking, but we're kind of, you know, sauntering down the hall trying to get out of the building, but not taking it very seriously until we see kids race down the main hall and at that point we realized, okay, yeah, this, this is a very serious situation. We, we get out here and we spent, I don't know how long. Um, there are parts of my memory that make it seem like it was an hour and a half and there are other parts of my memory that make it seem like it was no more than five minutes. But we spent a period of time in, in Leewood just across the street from Columbine trying to figure out what's going on because none of us knew. And so we're 
talking to, there's a thousand of us milling around out there and we're talking to our friends, trying to hear what's going on and, and it's kind of a similar situation in terms of the story started to escalate in severity. And at first it was somebody brought a gun and it accidentally went off. And then somebody else said, no, somebody brought a gun and they used it very deliberately. And then somebody said, oh, it was an automatic weapon. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and then I've spoken to a, you know, a number of people who were around that area at that time. And I think Mandy was one of them and totally different memory of how things started. I remember it crystal clear and I don't know if I fabricated it, but um, I remember telling the police the next day that we were all kind of walking around for a while trying to figure out what's going on and then I remember hearing explosions uh, that were probably the pipe bombs going off by the library or in the library and we all just stopped. This eerie silence hit the park and we all stopped and looked at the building and then I remember hearing something that sounded like shots and then everybody just took off into the neighborhood. Um, everyone spilled over into the Leewood Park and there were kids jumping over fences into backyards. And I remember uh, a couple friends and I were sprinting down the street and you know, we take an immediate left and then a right and kind of just, just trying to get away from the building as soon as possible. And this woman was outside tending to her garden because it just snowed just before. And she sees all these kids run down the street and she's like, what's going on? And there's a problem at the, at the school. There's, there's something going on at the school. So she welcomes it had to have been about 30 kids into her house. And so 30 of us spill into this woman's house. And um, the same situation as Zach, I, I remember calling my mom to tell her that I was okay and to figure out what's going on. But you know, she had, I tried to find out something about my brother because he was going to the school at the time and my cousin and couldn't find out anything. Called my mom, she said she hadn't yet heard from him. So she said to stay in the house, stay where I know you're safe. I need to stay at home in case your brother calls. And so I spent, I think, probably the next, it's probably about four or five hours in this woman's house watching TV so that we could find out what was actually happening. Um, she called me back about an hour and a half later saying that she'd finally heard from Aaron, that he was in uh, the library and that he had spent the majority of what was going on in, in a science room and then gone to the auditoriums. So she says, uh, you know, I'm going to try to get hold of him. And the second I do, I'll come pick you up. I gave her the address. It took another three hours for her to get her way into the, the neighborhood because they quarantined it. Uh, you couldn't get in or out unless you had lived in the neighborhood. So she found a cop that she knew, luckily, and he let her in to get me. So she picked up Aaron, came and got me. We went to grab a couple kids from Leewood because that was kind of a congregating point for most families. And then it took about 45 minutes to wind our way out of the neighborhood so that we could go home. And yeah, I remember getting home around dinner time and watching news for <laughs> the next 24 hours. Um, got out fairly quickly when the fire alarm went off. Again, didn't understand the urgency. I remember walking down the hallway with a friend. Um, but I remember going to Leewood Park and the teachers were standing on the sidewalk at the front of the park. So on the other side of the street from the school, but it felt like they were a shield and I, I can't tell you in reality exactly how they were poised, but I remember I felt very protected um, because they were just lining up there. And I think that's another piece of why I wanna be back in a school working here. Um, so something happened, I don't know what it was, but everyone you know, started, something kind of erupted. And I remember hearing a particular teacher yelling at us to run, you gotta get out of here. And that was the first moment I really felt like I was in danger. Um, I felt like I was running for my life. Um, and I was afraid to look behind me. <laughs> so I ran into the neighborhood. Um, and I had a friend that lived just a couple blocks in. So about a, probably a group of about 30 of us went to his house. I don't think we were in the same mm -hmm. houses, but um, we just took turns calling our parents. Um, we tried to watch the news. We listened to the helicopters. Um, there were lots of people praying, lots of people crying. And eventually word got out that we needed to go to Leewood Elementary. And that was gonna be our place where we'd find our parents. Um, and it, in my memory, it was like five hours <laughs> that I was time. just, yeah. in the house that I was in, it was uh, actually, um, the dad was a cop and he wanted us to all go down in like the lower level because he knew something significant was going on and he didn't want any of us in the line of sight of anyone outside. 
So we were hiding, taking turns making the calls. Then finally we went over to Leewood Elementary and I saw my dad. My dad picked me up and you know, he has red hair. He's not the most tan person, but I've never seen him look that pale. Um, and he hugged me so tight. I had to tell him to let go because I couldn't breathe. Um, and it still didn't hit me. I, I still didn't understand what was going on. I was 16, you know, how much could I understand? Um, but that was the first glimpse of how serious this was because I've never seen my dad so shaken. Um, and he, you know, years later, he told me that when he was driving to come get me, he was listening to NPR. And the thing that stood out to him was a line, the unthinkable has just happened at Columbine High School. And he said he pushed on the gas a little harder <laughs> when he heard that. Um, but I remember going home and just being in a daze for days, trying to figure out which way it was up. Uh, I was a freshman and that day kind of unfolded like any other normal day. Um, I was in the art classroom, which is about as safe and far away from any of the events of that day as, as you could be if you were attending school that day. Um, the fire alarm went off and I think we kind of all thought it was uh, either an alarm or a senior prank. Um, and so we were just kind of in that awkward standing up, what do we do, and, and that type of stuff. And then um, it wasn't until some students kind of ran by the classroom and yelled in, this isn't a drill, um, that that's when the red flags started to first, um, you know, pop up. Uh, and so we walked out, and we walked out like it was a fire drill um, until we walked to the front of the school, and that's when we saw students kind of sprinting out and streaming out um, and crying and, uh, people discussing about guns and a gang fight and, and whatever rumors were starting to circulate uh, right at the beginning of the day. And my class just walked out to Clement Park and we, we stood and, and uh, waited for the policemen to show up and at which point they sent us home. And I kind of remember um, thinking, well, you know, what about class, you know, later that day? You know, that's where my head was. I was still worried about like, well, I'm gonna be at marked absent, you know, like unexcused absence. My, parents are gonna kill me, you know, that's where I was. Um, so then we, we went home and that's when you turned on the news. I lived really close. You could see my house from the math, the math wing. And so sitting in my house, you'd see the house, uh, you'd hear the helicopters and see the, the news unfold and you'd see your house. Um, and so it really wasn't until I got home that you started to understand the, the scope or even start to put the pieces together. Um, and then the, I, have a, I have an older sister that was a senior, and so she was in the building for a long time, and that was the, that was the hardest part of the day, was waiting because we didn't have any communication, and you're waiting to hear from a friend from a friend. Um, there was no way to kind of know where she was, um, and so that was the most stressful, stressful kind of piece of my day, was waiting for news from my sister um, and getting the, that she was okay, and kind of watching the events unfold from the news.